I want to begin this really important conversation with just a word of gratitude and respect for you and for all the things that are on your hearts and minds and for all the ways that you seek to make a difference uh, in this world. We face a lot of challenges and oftentimes we're at a loss for how to address the challenges that we face. I also want to offer a word of respect and gratitude to you for all the different perspectives that you bring. We are a church of great diversity, of ideological differences, and uh, I think when we are able to harness all the, those different perspectives in the spirit of respect and civility, we can really learn from one another, and we can find common ground and figure out how to make a difference. So with that in mind, as we, as we begin to have a really important conversation, uh, I'd like to take a moment to invite you to pray. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, we gather here today and we ask that you give us open hearts and open minds. We believe that we need your guidance and wisdom on how to be more engaged in these critical moments. Help us to learn how to build stronger, more equitable communities. Help us to understand the power that you have bestowed upon us and give us insights and how we can use that power in this world. And most especially, grant us the courage to step outside of our comfort zones and taking action toward creating positive change. Give us wisdom to collaborate with others so that together we can work for the common good. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it is a great thrill to welcome today uh, Eric Liu, who I have to say is someone that I've been trying to get to come to Christ Church for years and years, but it turns out everybody else is trying to get him to come, but we finally won, and I'm just thrilled uh, by that. Uh, um, before I formally uh, introduce Eric, I want to tell you that I think one of the things that was most, I was most drawn to was his gentle spirit and his joy and his ability to, uh, to really have an open heart to a wide range of different perspectives. I have seen him in, uh, in rooms with powerful people, very powerful people with lots of different thoughts. And one of the things I think that's so amazing about Eric is his ability to meet with people across the ideological, socio-political divides and work to equip every individual and community uh, to think about how they can make a difference. Uh, Eric uh, is uh, the CEO of Citizens University, which is a national not-for-profit uh, that empowers people to become active and engaged citizens. Uh, he is uh, also um, a writer uh, who has some of the most amazing books that I have read Become America, um, You're More Powerful Than You Think, I think Gardens of Democracy, um, and then uh, a report that Citizens University, uh, the Commission on the Practice of Democratic Citizenship, Our Common Purpose, uh, Reinventing American Democracy for the 21st Century. Uh, I met him um, at the Aspen Institute, where he's a senior fellow, and where he works to advance the Institute's mission to foster enlightened leadership and encourage the exchange of ideas. Throughout his life, uh, from his time in college, at Yale College, where he heard a, a call, and I'll get you to tell him about the call that you mm -hmm. felt there, to uh, going on to Harvard Law School and uh, working in and around government, um, he has led a life fully dedicated to, I think, what we all can agree to as one of the most challenging uh, things to address, which is how we 
how we engage in our, in our society uh, to address these challenges. So please, it's a long introduction, join me in welcoming Eric <coughs> to Christ Church. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for being here. So we're gonna do some things a little, a little different today because we really do want this to be a time of equipping for you. Um, so I wanna ask you to turn to the person next to you and talk about a concern that you have in our city. We seem to be having a laser light show here. <laughs> um, that's to keep you on your toes. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you and just name one complicated issue that brings you worry and concern in our city, in our nation, or in our world. I'm sure you'll have plenty to talk about, just, but just name one. Okay, Laura is going to walk around, and um, one of the things that, again, I really want us to appreciate is the different perspectives we have in this room. So I'd like you to name the issue without naming an individual or uh, an, uh, an organization or, or political party that you disagree with. Just name the concern. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Uh, my concern, sorry, I'm so loud. My concern is public education. Thank you, Lucy. There's one over here. Over here? Stay here. My concern is people seeming inability to disagree without becoming disagreeable. Thank you. Let's do a few more. Maybe someone on this side of the room. Mine is the homelessness in the area and the country. Thank you. One more over here. <laughs> the encroaching uh, centralized authoritarian government into all aspects of our lives. Okay. So, how many of us feel as though we have the power within ourselves to change things in our culture? How many of us feel, how many of us are, are kind of cynical about whether we can really make a difference because things seem to be the way they've always been and will always will be? All right. All right, Eric. It's on you now. All right. You've, you've written that we're more powerful than we think. What does that mean? What, what is power? Well, uh, Chip, first of all, let me just say thank you uh, for that introduction and for this welcome. And it's just, it's awesome to be here, uh, to feel this community and to just feel the sense of uh, commitment and presence and, uh, and knowing that this is a community that shows up not just uh, for service, but for these kinds of conversations and for these kinds of gatherings and uh, is a politically diverse uh, community. It, uh, you know, I travel all around the United States uh, doing all different kinds of gathering and, and teaching and uh, this is pretty remarkable. So I just want to uh, kind of name that and acknowledge that in thanking you. Um, <clears throat> so let me back up a half step. Um, Citizen University, the organization that I uh, lead, we're based in Seattle, we work all around the United States, and our work fundamentally is about trying to foster a culture of powerful, responsible citizenship. And we really emphasize culture, uh, because we live in a time right now where you know, some of the things that some of you just named as issues of concern, whether it's homelessness or uh, otherwise, are issues that have to do with maybe policy and structural change and 
you know, uh, the, the, the size and reach of government is certainly a structural uh, policy consideration. Uh, but part of our view in our work is that uh, as important as those structural issues are, and you know, pick your issue, right? Homelessness and crime and immigration, there, there are structural dimensions to those, that culture precedes structure. Culture, by which I mean the norms, the values, the narratives, the habits, the mindsets, the heart sets that shape what we think is normal and what we think is okay. Culture defines the frame of the possible when you get to structure, right? And so if you have a culture that is hyper-individualistic and self-seeking and um, super-materialistic and without historical memory uh, and all about rights but not about responsibility, well, you're going to get a pretty, you know, a certain kind of uh, uh, policy outcome and structural environment. But you have, if you have a culture, as you all have here at Christ Church uh, Charlotte, uh, of mutuality, of service, of contribution before consumption, of circulating your power and not only hoarding it, for yourself, um, then you get a different kind of arena for structural change. And so I really want to name that first because when you start talking, diving right into power, um, you can forget the ways in which we determine what is normal and what is okay in the uses of power in a society. They're, they're, we are those determinants. And we define power in a very simple way, Chip, which is a capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do. And, you know, that is a little bit of a menacing sounding uh, definition, right? Like, oh, you know, this is kind of a Game of Thrones manipulation and beheadings kind of approach to power. Um, but let's be honest, in every circle of our lives, in work, in family, in neighborhood, we are always, we're, as humans, we are always trying to get others to do as we would like them to do. That capacity, when brought to bear on issues of common concern in civic life, is what you can think of as civic power. And civic power takes many different forms. Ideas power, the power of an idea like liberty, uh, the power of social norms. Do we think it's normal and okay to fill in the blank, treat each other uh, with incivility, uh, to treat each other with just common discourtesy? Uh, is that just normalized, right? Uh, the power of social norms, the power of state action uh, to determine what uh, can and can't happen, the power of money to shape opportunity. We talked last night at dinner, Chip, about how Charlotte, uh, you, you all are aware, I'm sure, because Chip has been uh, banging this drum, <clears throat> that uh, less than a decade ago, uh, this national study found Charlotte to be 50th among 50 uh, major metropolitan areas in, in the United States in social mobility. Uh, and you had to ask yourselves as a community, and you have begun to ask yourselves deeply and organize yourselves to reckon with that, right? So power takes these different forms, and in our work at Citizen University, power is only half the equation. Because when we talk about citizenship, and I, I should hasten to add, citizenship is not for us primarily about documentation status and United States passport holding. Uh, that is important. That is a legal status of citizenship, but I mean it in the deeper, broader ethical sense that you all are living it, which is being a member of the body, being a contributor to community, a pro-social contributor to community. And citizenship understood that way, we have a very simple equation to define it, which is power plus character equals citizenship. That to live like a citizen in this broader sense requires both a fluency in power and understanding who does have the money, who does have the ideas shaping power, who, who are the folks in state uh, uh, positions of power in government uh, to change things, uh, who does have organized capacity for force and violence. You know, those are sources of power and you have to understand and have a fluency in power to be capable as a citizen. But if all you have is a fluency in power and get very, very skilled at kind of moving people and ideas and money and force to achieve your ends without any ethical core, without any moral compass, then all you're doing is training to be a finely skilled sociopath. And so the other half of that equation of character, uh, by which we mean not the usual American way of talking about this, which is individual personal traits of grit and perseverance and honesty and diligence, all those matter, right? There's not a person in this room who doesn't have that dimension of personal character, but we mean character in a civic sense, in a collective capacity. How do we live together? How do we hold a community together? 
values and norms of service and contribution and mutuality and reciprocity. And so for us, citizenship is about combining power and character. And all of our program work is about, in one way or another, teaching power, democratizing to people how they can find their power so that next time Chip asks you how many of you feel powerful and able to change something in this room, all of you should be raising your hands. You're members of the Christ Church Charlotte congregation. I don't, you know, I'm kind of new to town, but I know enough now to know that there aren't a lot of places on Sunday in Charlotte that have as much accumulated power as this place does in all the ways that I talked about, right? And the fact that you don't feel that is telling. It's interesting. It's partly because we haven't been invited to inhabit the full dimensions of our power toward community. We've, we've been invited to do it in ways that advance ourselves, uh, but that deeper invitation to do it in ways that are civic uh, is a big part of what I think um, this opportunity, what Faith Forum is about. And you know, for us in our work at Citizen University, just like for you in showing up for something like uh, this at Faith Forum, it is about asking that question of how do we actually find and activate that capacity within ourselves? How do we actually skill up in the practice of power in a civic context uh, that can actually change uh, the, the, the trajectory of a community like Charlotte. All right, so, but if I say to you, this sounds great, we've got all this accumulated power, but, you know, Eric, I get up in the morning, I go to work, mm -hmm. okay? And I read about things in the news, and, you know, I've got to take care of my family, and I've got all these different, different responsibilities. Um, uh, and frankly, I... I don't even know how to be to be engaged. You know, I, I mean, the bank asked me to give money, and you know, but that's somehow tied to my, uh, you know, whether I'm considered a part of the team. Uh, I feel compelled toward toward generosity, but I, I, I'm just not there yet in trying to figure out what I can do with my limited time to make a difference in the life of this city. Well, I think, you know. First of all, there's a mindset choice to make. Uh, and I think if each of you were to take a moment, even as I'm talking here, to take a silent inventory of the different forms and sources of power that you have at your disposal, uh, you don't have to say it out loud, but be honest with yourself about your people power. Who are, who are some of the people you could mobilize and activate and organize to do something, to do anything? A food drive, uh, a birthday party, you know, come into faith form, whatever it is, right? Your people power. What is your ideas power? Your ability to actually express ideas about citizenship and the role of government, about the, the, the crises of homelessness here and in other parts of the United States. What is your money power? Your ability actually to bring financial resource to bear on an issue uh, or on a common problem. And when you take that inventory for yourself, uh, you'll see this kind of mound of capital emerge in your mind's eye. And I don't mean just financial capital. I mean social capital, intellectual capital, relational capital, reputational capital. Christ Church Charlotte, member of this congregation, right there you have reputational capital that is immense, right? And when you take stock of that, those different kinds of capital and power that you have, you come to a fairly simple binary choice which is the first thing that I want to invite you to reckon with. And the choice is, shall I hoard or shall I circulate? That is the first gate. Shall I hoard or shall I circulate? What do you mean circulate? Well, circulate is simply this. Shall I bring to bear what I know about how to move things, what I know about how to get things done, what I know about how to change people's minds or hearts? Shall I bring that to bear in service of someone other than myself and my family and those closest to me? Shall I bring those things to bear? There are people in this room who are current and retired leaders from all different sectors in the military and business, faith communities, nonprofits. The gifts that are in a room like this are immense, right? And so first is this mindset. I mean, the, the reason why the title of that book that I wrote is You're More Powerful Than You Think is it's true. You're more powerful than you think. And when we start off by saying, well, I'm not that powerful. You know, I know powerful people, I, I, all that stuff. Don't, don't go there. Like, right there, you are giving away power, right? It's the same thing when people say, well, I don't vote because, you know, what's the point? My vote doesn't make a difference. And I often say there's no such thing as not voting. Not voting is voting. 
Not voting is voting to hand your power over to somebody else and let someone else use your voice and your stake in your name and perhaps against your interests, right? Not voting is wearing a sign that says, kick me on your back. Um, but so is not actually being honest about the different forms and sources of power that you have at your disposal. And so, yeah, you're busy. You're leading members of the community. You have a lot of obligations and commitments, you, you know, all that stuff. Um, and I think where you begin, you know, if homelessness is the thing that, uh, that moves you, um, you begin in ways that are available to you right here in the community of Christ Church. You begin by asking yourself, who is a group of other people who share this concern, mm -hmm. right? The most basic, the elemental skill to learn in civic life is not about how, to, how a bill becomes a law or how to move the legislature to do X or Y. It's can you join a club? Mm -hmm. Do you know how to join a club? So Everybody, if you, if you know how to join a club, then you have begun right there to build civic muscle. You've begun to actually pull yourself out of a passive spectator position into a sense of actual agency and ownership. And if that club is a club that's devoted to dealing with uh, folks in this community who are unhoused, who are facing hard times, great. If that club is something that is a gardening club or a book club, that's fine too, because you're still learning the art of association that has always been vital in a self-governing republic and that has evaporated in our lifetimes. We have become isolated and atomized and have our experiences mediated through TV and social media and we do not see each other and join with each other and we do not join across lines of difference. And here you have a congregation that has different kinds of world, world views represented in the room and so how do you commit to joining and forming circles of people to say, look, we don't, have, we don't even know where to begin yet on homelessness, but we know that we are moved in the heart to want to do something about this. Let's start learning. Let's start talking to folks who are frontline service providers. Let's start talking to folks who are building affordable housing. Let's start asking ourselves what have been the policy choices over 20, 30 years that have led to gentrification and displacement. What are the ways in which our mental health system has begun to break, begun to break down such that people who are facing mental health crises and, addi and addiction um, end up not so much supported by services but end up uh, on the streets. And you begin to see this bigger picture here, but you know, that bigger picture begins with a sense of motivation. Like that stuff is, it's complicated, but you can, you're smart people, you can figure out those systems. The harder part is that first commitment. Well, let me ask you about that because again, I, I wanna take on the, I wanna take on a, a role here <clears throat> with you and, and I wanna walk into all these things you're talking about. I tell you, I'm concerned about homelessness, but I'm kind of depressed, you know? So um, what do you say to the person who says, you know, I'm depressed, all I ever hear about is homelessness, all I ever hear about is that uh, we, we, the, the city's growing and more and more people are being dis displaced with gentrification. I mean, I, I care, I'd love to make a difference, but you know, I think I'm just gonna sit here and, and scroll TikTok. <laughs> Uh, and 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 uh, you know, and try to distract myself, you know, from from all this pain and this disappointment. I mean, um, how, what do you say to people who who care, hmm. who care about homelessness, who care about all the concerns that people are saying, but you know, uh, there's good reason, perhaps, to be somewhat cynical about that anything that we do will bring about some kind of positive change when it seems like we build, we build, and then there's just a, a tidal wave that takes it all away. What, what did you say about that, that, um, that concern that so often we hear when that keeps people from moving into the public? Well, you named two different kinds of obstacles, uh, kind of emotional psychic obstacles. One is uh, pain, sadness, fear, uh, but the other is cynicism. Um, and I think those require two different kinds of responses. You know, the, the, the sadness, the depression, the, the helplessness uh, that you can feel when confronting an issue that feels so vast and immense and uh, be, beyond the capacity of any one of us to actually remedy. Um, first of all, it's great that you're naming that pain and that helplessness and that sadness. It's great to to, to acknowledge that. 
Um, and then again, to remember that uh, something that your membership in this community should be reminding you week after week, which is one of the greatest way, one of the greatest bombs for that kind of pain, that sense of helplessness, that sense of isolation and aloneness, is to be among others, is to not be alone. And, and be, scrolling social media is not being among others. It, it is not. It is actually a, an intensely mediated form of hyper-isolation. Um, and, it, and it kind of compounds that sense of depression and helplessness. Uh, but I think if you join with others and share with others that pain, like it hurts my heart that there's this much hurt in one of the wealthiest cities in one of the wealthiest country, in one of the wealthiest cities in the wealthiest country in the world. It hurts my heart, right? Well, let's start with that. Let's form a group of others who want to start with talking about that and talking about, well, where do we begin, right? Um, but the, the second obstacle of cynicism, I think is really important that, I'm so glad that you named that, right? The sense of, oh, well, you know, you can, maybe you'll make a little progress, but that progress will recede. Um, people will make uh, some kind of legislative proposal, but, uh, you know, there are unintended consequences, and then the government program goes awry, so on and so forth. And that description of efforts to remedy and unintended consequences and having to try a different way and adapt uh, and, and come at the, 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 the problem from a different angle, uh, there's a word for that, self-government. That's all that politics in a democracy is, is trying over and over again in different ways, hitting a wall, realizing that you've made some progress, and then realizing you know, in a week, a month, a year, a decade, a generation, that all that progress receded. Nothing is forever in anything. And certainly in the work of a self-governing democratic republic, nothing is forever. And so, and I mean that in both directions. I mean, nothing bad is forever. We, we, we live in a city, in a part of the country that was defined by segregation under law and segregation in social norms. And some of that has changed. Not enough of it, but some of that has changed. And why did that change? You know, when I think about that sense of, oh, I feel sad or I feel cynical about this, I think about someone like Septima Clark. Have any of you heard of Septima Clark? A couple of you? You know, Septi you know, you think about the civil rights movement, you hear about the people who you know, sat in at Greensboro, not far from here. You think about the people who in Charlotte were organizing in interfaith ways to join the civil rights movement. You think about Dr. King and so on and so forth. But people like Septima Clark, who were unsung, or Ella Baker, who's slightly more well-known, uh, people who did the ground-level organizing, not in the 60s when national news started paying attention to this, but in the 40s and the 50s. Septima Clark, all around the South started creating citizenship schools in poor black communities to teach people literacy, to teach people basic civics, to teach people in those communities the foundations from which they might claim their rights and their civil rights. Septima Clark and people like her had a thousand times more reason than anybody in this room to feel helpless, to feel isolated, to feel cynical about what change was possible. And a whole wave of Septima Clarks, a whole wave of Ella Bakers is what gave rise to a whole wave of Dr. Kings and a whole wave of people then generations later, later, Harvey Gantz and others that are part of the Charlotte story, right? In different generations. But it is about the sense of when confronted with that cynicism about, well, things have always either been this bad or every time you take one step forward, you take three steps back. Commitment and persistence. Commitment and persistence not alone, not in isolation, because it is hard to sustain that in solitary, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but it is easier to sustain, sustain that um, in the company of others. All right, so now you got me fired up, all right? <laughs> now I, you've, you've embraced my cynicism and my fear, and now I'm fired up, ready to roll. So I decide that I'm going to come here to Christ Church, or I'm going to join up, link up with some people that are you know, we have people working on just about every issue in the city, uh, not just in, um, in, our, in our community, but you in various communities. I look around, and I see all the things that are 
that I know a number of you are, are organizations that you're a part of, uh, you're volunteering, you, you, ser you serve on boards, you're financially backing um, different organizations. Um, some of you are, are very hands-on in that work. Uh, but I, I, so I, I go to the, to the, the public conversation and I realize there are a lot of different perspectives there on how to deal with that. And what, what are the skills you think that we need to be now in a city where it used to be that, uh, you know, as legend tells, that there were a few men primarily that would make a lot of decisions about sort of how things work. But as Charlotte has grown and become my, more diverse, there isn't a single table. There are lots of tables, mm -hmm. you know. So, and I, and I would say, um, not just for adults, but I mean, you have, you have children. What do you feel like are the essential skills that we need in order to be in the public square, to have conversation across difference, and work toward the common good? That's a big question. Mm -hmm. How do we enter in to public conversations? How do we build bridges and determine collectively what's for the common good without killing each other? <laughs> well, you know, I think um, the first skill, uh, and again, this is not a um, technical skill, it's not a uh, how do you lobby or how do you write a business plan kind of skill, uh, th those can come later, um, is the skill of curiosity. My friend Monica Guzman from an organization called Braver Angels, some of you may have heard of, uh, which intentionally tries to bring together people from right and left, red and blue, you know, perspectives to, to reckon with hard issues and talk about their differences in worldview, um, has written a book uh, that I commend to you called I Never Thought of It That Way. Uh, and it is just about actually, um, you know, we have an impulse right now. There's a human impulse, but certainly social media and our political culture today amplify this impulse uh, that as soon as you get a glimpse or even a little taste of what you think someone believes, and maybe it's because of the color of hat they wore or because of a button they've got on or whatever, as soon as you've got a little sense of, oh, I know what box to put this person in, then you literally put them in that box and you smush them and you flatten them, right? And you turn a three-dimensional complex, maybe even contradictory human being into a two-dimensional caricature. And what Curiosity, what the kind of civic skill of curiosity does is it pops two dimensions back into three. Hmm. How did you, so if you come upon somebody, and maybe, maybe you come upon them by first entering into a room where you did share an initial interest in working on whatever, homelessness or you know, economic development uh, in Charlotte, um, but then you realize, oh, holy cow, this person votes, prays, thinks very different from me. Like, I'm amazed we're at the same table here. Um, as you get to know each other, um, you know, to avoid all the, again, the instincts that our current political culture teaches us to do, which is to try to play gotcha, to try to win, to try to dominate this person, but actually instead to say, how did you come to your worldview? Hmm. What shaped you? Right? And, they, and if they sense quickly that you're not playing gotcha, that you're not about to ambush them, and that you in earnest want to know, what were the forces in your life, the mentors, the tormentors, the, the triumphs, the tragedies, the whatever, that brought you to this worldview about people's responsibilities to each other, about the way systems work, whatever, right? People aren't just born with a, uh, with a worldview that authoritarianism, authoritarianism is bad or good. Uh, they're, they're shaped by experience. What are those experiences? Uh, and drawing that out. So curiosity is the first civic disposition. Let, let me pause you there. Yeah. Turn to the person next to you and name one person who's helped shape your worldview. It's an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. Another question is, who is currently shaping your worldview? Another question is, is there someone who thinks differently from you who is shaping your worldview? You know. Yeah, and as you sit with those questions, 
again, it's sort of like that exercise I was inviting you earlier to take inventory of your own stock of, of different forms of power that you have at your disposal. When you reflect upon who it is who's shaping your worldview, you know, for good and for bad, and they may be people you know and work with, and they may be people you only see on television, um, that shaping uh, is, again, part of that, that multi faceted way in which we together determine social norms and we determine together what is okay and what it means to actually uh, live together here. So that curiosity and that awareness of how another's worldview has been shaped and, and indeed then being able to express it uh, about yourself uh, is one. But then another one when it gets to actually, okay, like I get your worldview, thank you for explaining you know, wh where you're coming from, but we still disagree profoundly on X or Y. Um, then we have a different set of skills that um, one of the projects that we've catalyzed uh, in our work uh, at a project at the Aspen Institute called the Better Arguments Project um, is, is this endeavor to recognize in the first place that disagreement and argument uh, uh, is okay, right? And so the, the, the point that you were making, uh, ma'am, about being able to disagree uh, not disagreeably uh, is not only a matter of civility. I think the title for today's gathering was about civility, right? And, uh, and I, I, always, I, I always give two cheers for civility. Um, I, I, of course, I'd rather people be civil than not civil, right? Uh, but I think in different ways, and in every, every regional culture has its own version of this. Uh, you certainly, you know, uh, I, I live in Seattle. In the Northwest, you have a very, because it's very, you know, the, the political culture is very Scandinavian and Asian, um, you get this very indirect, passive-aggressive form of civility, right? We say, uh, bless your heart. Bless, and I was going to say, and in the South, you get the bless your heart version of civility, <laughs> when bless your heart basically means, you know, yeah. I want to kind of, <laughs> I want to shiv you right now, right? And, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. uh, I, you know, I and a couple of my high school buddies are here in the room, actually. Uh, are, we're from New York, so, you know, civility is not the highest order bit for us. Uh, but it's not, it shouldn't, you know, for none of us, for all of us, civility should not be the highest order thing, in fact. Civility is preferable because incivility can be poisonous, but justice is actually the highest order bit. And in the Northwest, when Pearl Harbor happened and people decided to round up Japanese Americans, Japanese American citizens of the United States decided to round them up and put them in camps, they did so perfectly civilly. They did so under color of law, and they did so with absolute politeness, and they, and they forced small business people to shutter their businesses with perfect politeness and civility. The segregationist politicians who dominated the United States Senate for three generations, for four generations, were, for the most part, incredibly civil. If you read the transcripts in the congressional record, they weren't arguing ad hominem. They weren't kind of being jerks in that way that we think of as uncivil. And so justice and a commitment to justice is the first priority. But when it comes to civility and it comes to arguments, it is recognizing that in a diverse, heterogeneous, multiracial, multi-faith, multi-perspective community like Christ Church Charlotte, like the United States of America, um, we can't avoid argument. Argument is inherent. America is an argument. America is a perpetual, unresolvable argument between liberty and equality. Right? We say those words like mom and apple pie, but if you stop and think about it for 10 seconds, liberty and equality are always in tension with one another. Too much liberty, you let everybody do whatever the heck they want, and you are going to have a recipe for rampant inequality. Too much emphasis on equality, and leveling and making everybody have the same thing, and you are completely stifling people's liberty. Right? Liberty and equality are always in tension. Colorblind and color conscious approaches to law and the Constitution are always in tension. Pluribus and unum, diversity and unity, are always in tension. Jefferson and Hamilton, small local government, strong central government, always in tension with one another. God help us if any one of these sides in any one of these polar arguments ever achieves final victory in the United States. If liberty ever achieves final victory over equality, or Hamiltonian views of strong central government ever achieves final victory over Jeffersonian views of limited government, then we're in trouble. 
right? It is the tension, it is the constant kind of negotiation of those things that makes us American. To be American is to be perpetually arguing over what it means to be American. And so... So how do we have a better uh, well, argument? Well, so the key then is to actually... So the Better Arguments Project starts with that premise that, it, you know, that the point for us shouldn't be to have fewer arguments, it should be to have less stupid arguments. Uh, and, and there is an actual methodology that we've devised over time in partnership with a whole range of organizations. Uh, our two biggest partners in this, uh, uh, one is a great education nonprofit called Facing History in Ourselves that began as a Holocaust education organization, but since has taken all other kinds of moments of deep moral choice making. The civil rights movement, for one. The anti-apartheid movement, for another. Um, as opportunities to, pr to to bring young people in high schools around the country uh, to essentially ask, what would you do? What would you have done? How do you actually kind of form yourself? And how do you see the world views of people who would have done things differently? That's one of our partners. And the other, um, you know, in the spirit of Charlotte being a, you know, a global capital of the financial industry, is the Allstate Corporation, right? And Allstate, though they're, not, they're based in Chicago, not here, they're a cousin to you all here. They're a cousin to Bank of America. They're a cousin here in their worldview. And also, you might ask, well, why does a company like Allstate care about this? Because Allstate, like Bank of America, is in every community in the country and has people of every perspective in their workforce and in their community. And they've got to figure out for themselves within their own ecosystem hmm. how they get people to deal with each other in healthy, constructive ways. And so a better, the Better Arguments Project lays out three dimensions and five principles of a better argument. And, and I'm not going to go through all of those. You can, betterarguments.org is the website. Uh, there are workshops, both online and in person. There's a Better Arguments Ambassadors program where we're training cohorts of people all around the country to, um, to form these skills and practice these skills and then bring them back to communities like Christchurch Charlotte. Um, but I want to name one or two of these principles because they go directly to your question and they go directly to the kinds of things that are in your, on your hearts and in your minds here. One of the principles of a better argument um, is, and this is, it's the first one, and it's maybe the hardest one, emotionally and psychologically, and that is take winning off the table. Again, if you, and this is part of curiosity. If you go into an argument not to win, but to understand, it changes everything. It changes the energy, it changes the dynamic, it changes the willingness of the other person to engage you. If they sense that you're not there to kind of own them, humiliate them, kind of, you know, uh, shame them in this, uh, crush them in this debate, but actually to understand them, right? That is profoundly important and profoundly hard because human instincts, again, fed by our times, uh, are to own the libs or own the magas or whatever it is and, uh, and, and, and crush them in, in mockery. Um, but the fifth principle of those five um, is to make room for transformation. And the way we express this is, you can't possibly change another person's mind if you're not willing to have your own mind changed. And so to enter into these arguments with a willingness to be moved, not only with the objective to move others, right? And, um, and so this is not just about a skill of listening. Listening matters. Uh, but, you know, there are different kinds of listening, right? A lot of people in today's political culture practice what I call debaters listening. <laughs> I'm going to listen to you in as much as I need to kind of get a sense of where you're coming from, and then I'm going to tune out as I prepare my rebuttal, right? That's not listening. That's just tactical, you know, reconnaissance. Uh, 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 and, and, and I think what we're talking about here is a listening in which, wow, I, I, again, to cite my friend Monica's book, I never thought of it that way. That actually shifts something. And... And it will not cost me anything to admit that I never thought of it that way. And I think that's the most important other part here, Chip, which is, and again, the, and the benefit that you have being in a community like this is that you've been building this muscle of trust. If you trust the person you're with, then you won't be afraid to admit that you never thought of it that way. You won't be afraid to admit that maybe something's shifting. You won't be afraid to admit that maybe you, you've been wrong or been... Uh, you know, had, had a blind spot. If you don't trust the person, you're never going to go there. Uh, and so, you know, how do you build trust? By being trustworthy. By being worthy of trust. By behaving these ways that set this process in motion. And again, this is risky. 
Why should I be the sucker who opens my heart? Why should I be the, the, the person who says, I'm willing to have my mind change and then have this guy steamroll me uh, uh, and attack me? Yes. You know, I wasn't raised in any faith tradition, so I don't uh, speak from, a, from life experience of the Christian tradition, but I will tell you, as maybe we'll get into a little bit, in our work at Citizen University, we have been influenced a great deal by all manner of faith traditions. And across the board, in every tradition you might find, has to be this level of humility. Non-righteous humility. Right? When people, there are people right now who warn, oh, our politics is becoming too much like religion. And if you've heard people say that, right? If politics becomes religion, that's a dangerous thing. And I pause and I think, that's interesting. That reveals to me that you have a pretty negative view of what religion is. That reveals to me that you think religion is all righteous dogma. That religion is all kind of forcing people into an orthodoxy. But what you've experienced here and what you know is that religion is about searching. It is about questing. It is about discernment. It is about finding shades of gray. And that capacity, if you initiate that, you know what you're doing when you do that in a, in a potential argument, you're taking a leap of faith, a leap of civic faith, uh, that doing that will be rewarded or requited, uh, or at least will not be punished, and that leap of faith will not always actually pay off. But this is where the persistence matters, and I think building that habit of, I'm just going to keep on doing this and keep on taking that leap of faith till this person I'm in disagreement with realizes I'm for real. I actually do want to learn. I actually am willing to change. And that's not saying I surrender my worldview. I still have my worldview. I still have my principles, my life experience. But I think these kinds of um, choices, again, are not about the technical side of structure and policy. They are about the moral, ethical, inner choices we make uh, that radiate out in our outward civic life. Well, we're, we're going to make you an honorary Episcopalian uh, <laughs> because I think, uh, I think you sound like one. And, you know, it's interesting as you're talking about these things, the, the range of different ideas, emotions, feelings, approaches, ways that we uh, enter into conversation, uh, triggers, all the various things that can either move us forward or, or uh, set us aside. Um, these are uh, these are the things that 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 we de we deal with day in and day out, and what's interesting is everything you're saying is almost like a precondition, and a part of before you even begin to go out and do anything, before you go to the community meeting, um, uh, before you go to the organizing event, um, before you you vote, there is. Uh, and this is, this is, I just want to take note that for us, this is a very much a part of the inner life that we're trying to cultivate. Um, who am I? What do I, what do I stand for? Um, what am I still trying to figure out? Uh, how do I relate to people that are different from me? Um, how do I sustain the work of, of keeping moving forward when I feel like there are setbacks. And so I do want you to say a word about your organization and some of the things that you do working across the political divide um, that, that we believe can help us as we emerge out of COVID, as we think about being more engaged in the life of our community. Uh, there, there, this is a, a, a set of, uh, this is about, to me, about spirituality. It's also about um, the ongoing need to be a, a learner mm -hmm. and, and to continually be equipped to have a greater capacity to go into and be in the public space where change happens. So what are the things that you, that you do that help people stay in this place of learning and help motivate them to remain in the place of transformation? I love that phrase, the place of transformation, and I think that that is... Um uh, we're always in the place of transformation. The, the one amendment I would make to what you were saying a moment ago, Chip, is that this stuff that we're talking about here is not before the work of going into community. It is not prior to. It is simultaneous with. Simultaneous. Right? And I yes. think the, from a different tradition, Buddhists, you know, how do you practice Zen Buddhism? And, and 
of course, you can sit in meditation and, uh, and contemplate uh, uh, you know, Buddhist teachings and Zen teachings, but uh, the, the four-word formulation that I've heard that best encapsulates how you practice Buddhism is chop wood, carry water. When you are just chopping wood and carrying water, when you are just doing your daily stuff, mm -hmm. is your chance to practice Buddhism, right? And so that simultaneity of the, uh, th this mindset that we're talking about um, is one thing I just wanted to, to name. But uh, to your question, um, Citizen University, um, we work in a variety of ways, uh, different program streams. Probably our best known program is one that is very pertinent to all of you here. It's called Civic Saturdays. Um, and these are gatherings that uh, we began in Seattle but have since spread all around the United States that are essentially a civic analog to a faith gathering. It is a civic, a civic equivalent to church. It's not church, it's not synagogue or mosque, but on purpose it has the arc and the flow and the feel of a faith gathering. People will turn to each other at the beginning, the way you just invited folks to today, to talk about a hard or an unusual question that's not just small talk. Who have you failed lately? Who do you feel responsible for? What is broken in your heart right now? Right, questions like that. Uh, people then uh, will hear readings of texts uh, drawn from all different parts of the American tradition. Frederick Douglass and Septima Clark and Chief Seattle and Susan B. Anthony and you name it, right? Ronald Reagan. People will sing together and they'll sing not books from a Christian hymnal but sings from different parts, songs from different parts of the American tradition. Uh, civil rights anthems, protest songs, patriotic songs, you name it. Uh, someone will give a civic sermon to try to make sense of the times right now of how we actually live like citizens, how we, show, how we combine power and character in the life of our community. And then the most important thing at the end, people form up into civic circles where they take that inspiration, motivation, and actually talk to each other about, okay, what shall we commit to do in our community now? And we started these in Seattle and people started hearing about them. They asked me and my team, hey, can you bring a Civic Saturday to you know, Des Moines and to, uh, you know, Dallas and to all these different places. And for a while we did, but, um, you know, that is a super not scalable strategy, just running around the country like that. And so um, we created a civic seminary program where we train now people from all around the United States, people like you who are catalytic members of a community. Civic seminary. Civic seminary. Come to Seattle for a week. You get trained not only in the nuts and bolts of how to hold this space and hold these gatherings, but more deeply, to recognize the deeper ways in which democracy itself requires the same kind of mutual commitment and leaps of faith that we've been talking about here. And you might ask, well, why, you know, why use this religious kind of framework and metaphor? Why, why this whole approach? And, and there's two reasons. One is, you know, you all have figured something out over the millennia about how to invite people into community to make meaning uh, through hard times and through diversity and conflict. Uh, but the second is that we are a nation bound together by one thing, and that is a creed, an idea, a set of ideas. We are not a nation of a common bloodline. We are not a nation that has a single history and a single piece of soil. We're not a nation that worships a single god. All we have is a set of ideas that we know the versions of them in the American creed, liberty and justice for all, government of, by, and for the people. These truths are self-evident, right? We the people, there are creedal beliefs that from the beginning have shaped this country's life, from the beginning have held us together, they've been the magnetic core, and from the beginning have inspired people to force this country to live up to those ideas. Every movement of change in this country has been a movement that's not been anti-American, but has been let us redeem the American idea, right? Every abolition was a movement to redeem the American idea of liberty. The Civil Rights Movement was an, a movement to redeem Section 1 of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, that all persons born, or born in this territory are citizens of the United States, and that we shall have equal protection of the laws. Right? This creed is not self-executing. It is not self-operating. This creed requires continual renewal of commitment continual exercise of faith and continual ritual and practice. 
And that's why we created Civic Saturdays, to give people a container in which to regularly, as a matter of ritual, as a matter of commitment, rekindle their belief. Again, not in the dogmatic, top-down, here's the one way to think about America way, but come into the space so that you can ask yourself, what does it actually mean in a time where, is this, where there is this level of inequality and privation in our community, where every day to walk to my office, I walk past someone who's sleeping on the streets? What does it mean to live up to the idea of equal justice under law? How do we reckon with that? How do we live with that? Right? And Civic Saturdays were created for, for that kind of awakening of people's sense of responsibility. And so Civic Seminary, now we've trained, you know, just in the last few years, over 200 people in communities around the country. Not just big cities, not just blue communities, red places, purple places, small towns. We have people in just 40-some states doing this. Right? And I think the, that approach um, works for some people who are involved in faith communities. They're like, OK, I get this. This is plug and play. right? Yeah. Um, and for others, they're like, hmm, I, I have my faith community on Sunday. Why do I need to do this thing that's kind of faith analogous? Um, and if that's the way you feel, great. Then find your own way. Form your own club. Make your own, use this as your channel to be of use to the community and to our country, right? Yeah. But the idea that animates us is that, uh, again, you don't just get to sit back and think America's gonna take care of itself. We all have a responsibility to, to hold up our corner. Uh, and to hold our peace uh, of it. And, uh, and that is a matter of a continual rekindling of that civic faith. We, we are about out of time, but I want to just start with a question um, that Eric raised. Try to imagine the power that you have in all the ways that he just described the power that you have in terms of influence, relationship, money, uh, time. Try to imagine and take hold of all of those assets that you have. Now, think about how much of that are you keeping to yourself, you use the word hoarding, and how much of that are you circulating for other people for the common good. Live with those questions. And here's what I want to say. For those of us who are frustrated, down and out, feel like we, we can't really make a difference in the world, the actual truth is, is that when we actually do get involved in something that brings us concern or where we also see opportunity, that is one of the best ways to rejuvenate renovate and expand your heart because it is in the doing and in the loving and in the engaging and the ways that we we connect that we become more alive and the more we become alive the more the energy and the movement grows and then we begin to think about what are these leaps of faith that we can take in all these areas and that's when exciting things happen. So Eric, I can't thank you enough for being here. We are gonna stay in touch with you. We are gonna, okay. we're gonna really think about how we can be different from the American standard where only 53% of people give any money away, where 38% of people volunteer, where only 18% are engaged. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could rise into our awareness, rise into our, our skills, and really fully use the power of this church to do the Lord's work in and around the city. That's the dream. Chip, can I close yes. with one, one final thought and invitation? So uh, you are reminding me. Um, I want to invite you to go back uh, when you're home later today to, to ser search up a piece of a text that you can think of both as actual scripture but also civic scripture. And, and that is uh, the, the little sermon that John Winthrop gave aboard the Arbe uh, Arbella uh, as that first little ship of Puritans uh, pulled up in Massachusetts Bay. Uh, and uh, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, um, it was one of the greatest articulations of what it means uh, to hold a community together. And what he said as they were about to disembark and set foot on this land here to, 
uh, to make a new future um, was that we have to imagine ourselves as one body where we share in each other's pain, where we share the, in each other's delights. Uh, but what, we said, what he said ultimately, and what you just said, Chip, reminded me of this, um, was that when we do so, when we commit like this to each other and sustain this sense of, uh, uh, of mission, um, we shall be as like a city upon a hill. And you've heard that phrase in different parts of American life. You've heard that phrase, of course, in the church. You heard that phrase when Ronald Reagan in his presidency spoke of the United States as a city upon the hill. And what Chip has just invited you to do is to imagine first and then to bring into execution what it would look like if Christ Church Charlotte was a city upon that hill and what if, because of that, Charlotte became a city upon the hill and because of that, the United States became a city upon the hill a beacon to others, a light unto others that showed people what's possible when you show up in this different way. And, and I want to close with this invitation. If any of what I've said to you moves you, strikes you as something you want to participate in, uh, join us in our work at Citizen University. We're, our, we're very findable on the web, um, and we have programs, uh, other programs where we're uh, activating and training people just like you. Uh, to take forms of action and responsibility in your community. Um, one of them, uh, my, my friend Mark Perez, uh, who's here from the Charlotte Center on uh, Humanities uh, and Civic Imagination, um, we are creating something of a mutual aid uh, network here uh, in Charlotte, and we're creating similar ones in communities all around the country uh, called the Civic Collaboratory. So there are many opportunities like this for you to plug in, and I just want to um, uh, close with that invitation, uh, but also thank you all so much for um, your presence, your curiosity uh, and your commitment uh, and for being part of this community. And I look forward to our collaborations together. And I thank you more than I can possibly articulate for all that you do to stay in this conversation, in this, in this place of helping us understand and get animated to make, to make a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Eric for being here today.